Okay. We are recording. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, allowing me and affording me the opportunity to come. This is my first time presenting at a university. So I'm oh, very excited. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, congratulations on that, by the way. We're about that. <laughs> Syracuse.com. Uh, this is will not be a slideshow presentation. There's only five or six slides uh, just to level set and, and manage your expectations of what you uh, may or may not get out of uh, today. So the very first thing is I went to a conference last year and they said, like, listen, this kind of the culture of this conference to if you find that this isn't for you, just get up and walk out. So for virtual uh, partners there. You can certainly uh, log off. That I, I won't be offended because I know this isn't for for everyone. If you have a question, uh, I don't. Is there? Are you monitoring the chat or? Okay. Yeah, I can monitor. Yeah, so just like put things in the chat. Um, it, it, the stuff that we'll be going over is not prescriptive. It's really just meant to help you uh, kind of give you ideas and give you the ball and just have you run with it. Uh, and then the, the last two pieces of advice I have for you for any presentation that I give is if if you see a button and you don't know what it does, press it. And, and I grew up in the, in the in 1978, I was born and computer and I was using computer for most of my life. And if you hit the wrong button or you didn't save your work, it was just like curtains, like smoke would come out of your computer and nothing could be retrieved. But software has gotten so much more robust. Uh, that so and software engineers anticipate people pressing buttons and kind of poking around. And I know it's uncomfortable, but it can be transformative. So if you're in Brightspace or Google and you don't know what a button does, press it because you really can't screw it up. In fact, in Google, deleting things in Brightspace as well, it takes like three clicks just to delete things. Um, so you won't lose anything. And then the, the last thing is uh, oftentimes in presentations, I find that it's you, you there's just so much going on that you might not just have time to process it all. And that's okay. It, it, any of the stuff that we're doing today, it's not important that you remember how to do it. Just remember that it can be done. Uh, and, and even if we go over, say, 20 things today, even if you latch on to five or six of those things, you're like, oh, that's really what I want to do in my course this semester. Just latch on to those five things. You can always look to see how it's done later. This session is being recorded. My email is in the slideshow, and I'll give you a link to all of that in, in just a moment. Um, and, and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions for you. And, and also CIT is just a plug for SUNY CIT in May is always a great opportunity to kind of revisit these, these skills. So just to give you a little bit of background, I teach now I'm rounding out my sixth year, seventh year at FLCC, and I'm the coordinator for the Center for Teaching and Learning, which is the analog of the CELT here. I teach computer science, and before that, I worked at SUNY with when OSCA was rolling out. I worked at MCC, and I taught high school math for eight years as well, uh, but my gratitude today is for all of you attending. I know that uh, it's always crunch time before the semester starts, and there's a heavier load because of bright space and new spring courses they may not have taught. So thank you for, for tuning in today. Anything that I presented to you today, with the exception of one image I stole from the website of SUNY Oswego, is Creative Commons. So certainly feel free to share everything you want. And, and, and also just contact me if you have any questions. Again, uh, my email is on the, the, the website. Um, it's dave.cadu at FLCC, but it's in the slideshow and, you, and you'll see it. So before we Dig in. I like to do some kind of freebies. These are just kind of cool things that I've encountered. The very first thing is this website called coolors.co. And if you are artistically challenged like I am, this is a great website to go to. And if you're looking for, say, a color palette for your courses or or anything like that. Has anyone been here before? Have you been here before? Mm -mm. Oh, it's it's a it's a really cool uh generator. So you just go to coolers.co and it gives you five five colors, and if you hit the space bar, it will rotate through, and all these match. And if you have an affinity for one, you can lock it, and every time you hit space bar, it, it kind of narrows down the search. So you can get an entire palette this way. It's really, really cool. It gives you the hacks. Um, it has all these accessibility color blindness um, features in it as well. So coolers.core is the very first thing that I want you to take a peek at. In fact, the this particular slideshow was uh, used using coolers.co. 
Uh, Unsplash.com is my second one. Probably most of you, I can see some people in the room nodding their head right now, have been here. Uh, my beautiful wife is a librarian at Monroe Community College and told me about Creative Commons and specifically on Splash about 10 years ago. I was like, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. And uh, it's actually the best idea I've ever seen. So Unsplash is free, copyright free. They're Creative Commons Zero. That's a very permissive license. And so if you're doing a presentation or you need graphics for your course, in fact, I'm going to show you how I make graphics for my course, you can go here. All of these are from professional photographers and you can do whatever you want. In fact, you could, if you wanted to, collect all these photos of computers, make a coffee book and sell it in Amazon if you want. So the, and the, their, their search is just out of this world and that's Creative Commons. You can do whatever you want with those. So I really, really, really enjoy Unsplash.com. And then in the same vein is a website called Slides Carnival. And, and remind me again, you, you use Google here, right? Yes. Okay. So th if you, if you want to do really, uh, some graphic designer has created these slideshow templates and you can use them in Canva, Google Slides and PowerPoint. Some of them are Canva only because Canva has some kind of cool uh, presentation uh, features. But if you see one that you like, you just click on it and you can kind of advance through the slides and you can just make a copy of all these slides. So it has, you know, the, the basic package in each one of these. It's, it's really, really slick. So those are the three free things you get. And I, I find that oftentimes people walk away from my sessions not knowing anything about Brightspace or about Google, but they're like, oh, that unsplash.com, boy, oh boy. And they'll be talking about that for years. And maybe a plug for Canva too. Because yeah. Yeah. The, the canva.edu is, uh, if you have an EDU account, you get the Canva Pro for free, right? Mm -hmm. Which is awesome. It is an amazing program. I don't do my presentations in it yet, but I do know if you are presenting much like you would present in Google Docs or Google Slides or PowerPoint, if you hit the C key, then like confetti kind of comes down and you can hit the B key and it turns your screen, screen blank. So it has some, some sweet presentation effects. Uh, and then the one last thing is if you go to docs.new and since you're Google people, if you just go to docs.new, it creates a new Google doc right on the fly. And that's true for sheets and slides as well, which is really, really slick. I do that often instead of like going to Google Drive and then navigating to the folder and saying like, right click, make a new Google uh, doc. And you can always, um, oh yeah, you can, you need to have something in there before you, uh, but then you can organize it later um, after the fact with this uh, drive organization tool right here. You can move it to whatever folder you want. So uh, I've been using, that, that's basically how I create new Google Docs now is just by going to docs.new and then I worry about sorting them out later. Uh, oh, and there is one last thing. This is actually a, a major tenet for what we will be doing in this course. And so I see John Nottings head, so you know this. So I'm anticipating that a lot of people on campus know this as well. But if you if you replace in your Google Docs URL, if you can look up at this URL, if you replace edit with the word preview, then it kind of packages it up quite nicely and it's, it's in a more of a readable form. So you don't have the toolbar, it's just kind of strictly the text, which is nice. You can also just change the link to copy. And if this was a hyperlink, and, and you'll see this later on because I'll be doing this, when the user clicks on that link, it make it forces a carbon copy of that document. It's a great way to share templates with students and other things. Yeah, it, it's it's an amazing way. In fact, that's that's usually how I have them spawn kind of a uh, a carbon copy of my my assignment. Um, in the last thing, so I just want to show you this for now, and we'll come back to this also. If you change that edit or copy or preview to export question mark format equals PDF. And I know this sounds like super nerdy and super techy. Don't worry because I created a tool for you. So you don't have to worry about any of this, but if you change that and that's your link. So imagine this is your hyperlink right here. It will generate a PDF version and download it onto your computer automatically. And then you can open up and you can also change it instead of PDF to, to word. So students can apprehend a word version of say your course syllabus. Um, so those are really, really cool things. And the first tool I want to share with you is uh, part of a project that I've been working on. It's not live yet, but you get all you all get free special beta access to this. Uh, I'm 
I had, I, I'm starting a blog called Learn Brightspace. And if you go to learnbrightspace.com, you'll, you'll wind up here. And I'm going to have different different blog posts. This is just the stuff they don't teach you in Brightspace school. So it's kind of like the niche things. So if you are a fan of the T for Teaching podcast, for instance, you probably heard on one of the most recent episodes about intelligent agents and uh, checklists, things like that. So those will be things that you can uh, look at seeing here. But under tools, I created something called the Google Docs linker. And all you have to do is paste in. And again, that's just learn brightspace.com. Just paste in your URL and it will give you the links to make it generate a Q QR code, a thumbnail of it, um, a link to export it as Word. So this has the, the part of the, the end where it's format doc, same for PDF, and also a way to embed it with all these buttons here. So you'll see these throughout this presentation. Uh, but I just want you to know it's super easy to do. You don't have to be super tech nerdy like me. You can just go to this website and paste in your URL and everything is taken care of for you. The only thing is you need to make sure that the document is shared such that anyone can view it. Uh, and, and, and it's a little tricky because I can view it. I created it. So when I'm testing, I'm like, oh, yeah, of course I can see it. So you just have to make sure that you test it incognito or you'll get... 16 emails from your students saying, I can't see this document. And that's fine uh, because I need to just change. All you have to do is change the link um, or change the the access. The, the actual link to your document doesn't change when you change permissions. So this link will always be this link. It never, never changes, no matter who has access to what, uh, what features on your document. Okay. So with that out of the way, we're going to dig down a little bit deeper into how I leverage some of these tools. But are there any questions? Is anyone asking anything in the chat or does anyone want me to speak up, slow down? Um, so, so what does Brightspace think of you using their name in the, in the formulation of well, Brightspace? Itself? So far, I have not gotten a cease and desist letter. Uh, but I own learngoogledocs.com, learnblackboard.com, and a few other ones, and I st still don't have a cease and desist letter. Just don't try learndisney.com. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I, the, the mouse is going to be knocking on my door. Um, I, I did present at National Distance Learning Week uh, this, uh, this past year, and I presented basically this Learn Bright Space thing, and uh, there were a lot of people like, oh, this is... Uh, this is a really good idea. I'm glad someone's doing this because and Brightspace has a blog. It's a great blog, but it doesn't have that niche thing. So when you like dork around and press buttons in Blackboard, I'm sorry, in Brightspace, then you kind of figure things out. You're like, oh, it would be really cool this. Or if you're teaching for a semester, you're like, oh, students have really complained about this one thing and there's workarounds. So I'm hopeful that uh, at Brightspace 2023 conference, they'll fly me out but we'll see. <laughs> I guess I'll settle for not having a cease and desist letter. Yeah. Only uh, comment from the chat was wow. And I would like to echo that. So I feel oh, okay. like I have not uh, known a number of these things. Presentation's over. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> intrigued. Okay. Uh, so someone, okay, good, good, good. So let's get, let's dig into uh, things just a little bit now with how this plugs into Brightspace and what you can do. So I think what I'm going to do is take you on a tour of a fake course I set up and show you these features, and then we'll circle back and explore how to do them. So the, the very first thing is you'll notice that, and this is something I do in all my classes for the different modules, I always have my modules open from day one, and I signal to the students what's upcoming by having a, a unique image. And you might say to yourself, self, well, that kind of sucks because then when chapter one opens, you have to replace that image. And then you might be saying to yourself, also self, that's really distressing when I teach six different classes. What am I to do? So what I have done is, and at learnbrightspace.com, by the way, uh, if you go under presentations, there's, there's a link to the Swego Winter Breakout. And every file that I'm using is in this Google Drive folder that you have access to, as well as the uh, 
late last night when I was showing up my presentation, I exported my Brightspace file. So if you have a blank shell, you can certainly put it in and everything should work. I should with a capital S. So in my Google Drive, I have a folder where I have all these images. And I use Google Drawings a lot. And it, it's not Photoshop by any stretch of the imagination, but it works really, really good for most of the stuff that I do. I imagine if I was teaching graphic design or art, this would not be sufficient, but it's really great for light design work and also for hosting images. So when it's time for chapter one to open, I take my gray box and I just send that to the back. Uh, and if you're not familiar with sending to back, uh, it's kind of a scrapbooking thing. It's like if you have different layers and you want, you put a photograph down, you're like, no, I really want that like down as a background. It's like lift everything up, put that photograph down and then slap everything back down. Um, but the, there's a feature called um, send to back. And I just usually use a shortcut, but I want to show you what that's like. And then also in this upcoming, I just send that to the back. So all I've done is change it here once. And I've embedded this image and there's instructions on how to embed images. And I tend to keep all this stuff kind of off the canvas, like the source of where this unsplash photo came from, for instance. Even though it's CC0, I, I almost always give credit to the artist. In this particular case, I didn't uh, because it would be so teeny tiny small, you couldn't even see it. Uh, and, and then I just have all this, the, the alt text tag, and then I've fabricated this HTML thing. So when I go back to the course and I refresh, if this image was embedded in five different sections of my course, I change it in this one spot and it becomes live again. So I call this the set and forget method where you, I have set this once when I created the course or when I transfer the course or whatever, and I never have to touch how I embedded this image or where it lives because I know it's in Google drawings, it's in my Google drive. And I just need to know where this image is. In fact, I don't even need to log into Brightspace to update my content because it is it lives in Google Drive and I'm always logged into Google. So the, this is, again, just Google Drawings and in this folder that you can get at learnbrightspace.com and go to presentations, you'll have access to all these Google Drawings um, and all these uh, documents that I'm doing. So that's the first thing I want to show you is in this course, I do some, that's how I signal to students what's upcoming and what's not. And I actually, I'm sure most of you have this where students want to work ahead, like I'm going on vacation or I'm taking an extra week for spring break. What what am I going to miss? So having everything, uh, and, and that's tough when you're migrating to an LMS because your spring semester, you might not have those courses built yet, but every following semester, uh, I just like to have everything open from the beginning. So that's Google Drawings. And we'll come back to that because that's not the heavy hitting topics that you came here for. In most of my courses, I have a module called Welcome and Course Information. And this is where you would have your outline, the schedule, um, things that students might need. What I find is fascinating is having the course outline. And you'll recognize this setup, this configuration where it's actually an embedded Google Doc. And one of the nice things about having an embedded Google Doc, and again, I put the button so students can export that as a Google Doc or Word or PDF. You, I do wanna bring your attention to this. This is the first thing I've ever had on the accessibility checker. And I'm 110% convinced it's because I built this tool last night that one of that this blue color is not accessible, the contrast isn't enough. It's either this one or this one. So that's an easy fix for me. That's the only accessibility issue I've ever had. And that's uh, I'll be fixing that after I drive home today. Um, so with that said, this is my Google Doc. And this is also set and forget. So once I went through the rigmarole, and this is actually, I'll actually build this for you right now. Once I went through the rigmarole of creating the course document the, or the course outline, course syllabus, uh, different, whatever, you, what do you call it in a suite though? Course information sheet, document, syllabus. Syllabus. syllabus okay. Most yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, once you create it, 
All I did was I copied this link and I went to that tool that I built for you. You can go to learnbrightspace.com and click on tools in the Google Doc linker. I paste it in there and you get to, you can use these if you just want a button to X to download it as Word. Here's the HTML for that. And you can copy that. What I really wanted though was the total embed code with those buttons that's copy Google Doc, download as Word, download as PDF. And again, downloading in P as PDF is there's nothing special. It's the link of the URL of your Google Doc. And you just get rid of edit and put export format equals PDF. So I do all that uh, parsing for you. And you just have to copy that. Come to your course. And actually, I guess I'll just build a new one just so you can see how the magic happens. This is how the sausage gets made. So I'm just going to create a file. And here's the, the big, the, this is, if anything is going to derail you, this is where it's going to happen. If you just paste it right in this box, you need to click on this source code icon. And Blackboard had a very similar one. And I just select everything and paste it in. And voila, wait for it. I guess I need to have a title here too. Guess what folks, this is done forever because I don't need to change this from semester to semester. The only thing I need to change from semester to semester is in the Google doc where my course syllabus is. And I'm like, oh, this is spring. 2023. Let me change. Ooh. And now when students go, and I'm just going to refresh this page, but when they click on it, that change is live. And it, of course, there, there's more to change my course information sheet than that. You might need to change the due dates. You might need to change other information. I know the college policy has changed from time to time, uh, but I just manage it in the course syllabus. And in my Google Doc. And one of the questions I get is, well, what happens if a student, and this has happened to me in the past, what happens if a student comes back to you and like, I was in your course two semesters ago and I'm transferring and I need to get, send in the course syllabus. Can you send it to me? And meanwhile, I've been changing it from, you know, 2021, 2022. But Google Drive, all files have, including PDFs and movie files, have a version history where you can see any version from any specific date. So if a student came to me and you, uh, I happen to choose one because I just created this yesterday, <laughs> um, but I could go back, I could roll this back to 2021, 2020 and get them a snapshot of it. So this one document has history of all that stuff, which, which I think is kind of handy too. Um, so this is set and forget folks. Uh, and this is actually really, really the, the, the potency is palpable when you're teaching three sections of the same course because you change this one document that's embedded in three different Brightspace courses and uh, the, the changes go out immediately to all three courses. There's one question in the chat. Um, yeah. How did you link your course to Brightspace? Uh, I, I need clarification. Link my Google Doc or link my... Hello, did, did you want to <clears throat> chime in? Uh, yeah, uh, the, the uh, main uh, topic is you link your main course, the winter course in Brightspace to the, uh, there was a, you see this uh, Brightspace procedure. Um, could, you, could you repeat that again? Yeah, it's a little fuzzy. A little yeah, mm, maybe. Sorry about that. Uh, so I wonder, uh, how did you link your main course uh, in, under the name of Oswego Winter Breakout uh, to do uh, LP Oswego? Because in the beginning, you may, you choose that, then you link from your Google Doc. So are you asking how I changed the name of the course? No, no. Uh, I think she lost you when you were explaining how, how this was put into the course. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. it's not so much that the course is connected to Google, it's that the Google document is embedded in the course. Yes. So, so yes, it, yes, it, thank you for clarification. Yeah. 
let, let me do another demonstration. So this is my cheat sheet of things that I was going to go over today. Oh, look at all that. Um, all I did in, in, is I copied my URL and I have it at learnbrightspace.com. If you go to tools, Google Doc Linker, there's just a little software package that I whipped up last night for all of you. And I just paste it in. It generates all this HTML. So I'll actually go ahead and embed that document, which is very boring to all of you. Um, I'm going to copy this HTML, unless you know HTML and you want to program it yourself. Um, but this button will just copy that HTML. So it's in my clipboard. And I go to Brightspace. And let's say I want to put that in Chapter 2. I'm just going to upload and create a file and paste in that HTML that's already um, in my clipboard. So there's there's actually, if you think about it, there's like three things going on. You have to create your content in Google Docs. You have to go to learnbrightspace.com and paste the link of that Google Doc into that software that I wrote for you. And then you have to go into Brightspace, create a place for it somewhere. So I'll just say like um, agenda and paste it in. So all the like all the beautification happens by copying and pasting that HTML. So now when I hit save and close, you'll get that. And you can do that with any Google Doc that you want. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. And while, while we're at it, I do wanna show you one of the things of like setting and forgetting is I like to create my my office hours. And because I listen to T for teaching and teaching in higher ed, and I, I don't know which one is responsible for this, but someone had a guest on in one of these podcasts that said, I don't call it office hours, I call it student hours. Was that your I podcast? think we both have. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, I kind of like that. So so I changed it from office hours to student hours. And then I was like, oh, what? it's not even always an hour. It could be half hour. So I changed it to student time. Anyhow, student time is my euphemism for office hours. and. What I don't want to do is if I have three preps or four preps, what I don't want to do is change it in this course information sheet, go to my other class and change it in that course information sheet. So I'm going to show you uh, what I do is, and again, in here I have, let's see, which one is it? I create a Google sheet, which is their version of Excel. And I'll, all of you know that. Um, and I have a tab at the bottom, which is just my office hours, my student time. And a lot of people don't know you can do this. And this is relatively new in Google uh, Sheets. But you can copy this and paste it into your Word doc or your Google your Google doc. So what you see here is a live representation. What you see here is a live in my Google doc is a live representation of what you see here. So if I change my student time, let's say I'm going to say it starts at 1 p.m. And I'm I'm on the guest Wi-Fi here, so it's a little slow, but you can see it has created a button that says update. So now all I have to do is hit this update button. And when I go into my next course information sheet for the Java class I teach, I'll see that update button and I'll update it. And when I go into my Python class, I'll see that update button and I update it. So I I have part of the set and forget mentality is having in, in the software biz, we call this the single source of truth. You want one place where all the content is housed. Because if you have it in three or four places, like if I have it in three or four course information sheets, then I have to update it in three or four course information sheets, which means I have three or four opportunities to hit the wrong key. So I have a single source of truth for my, my office hours, and that's in this Google Sheet. And to construct it, I'll show you how I, I'll show you how I did it. Um, I'm just going to copy that. And I'm actually going to delete this table by right-clicking on it and going to delete table. So the very, very first time, and this is the only painful thing. You you go to your Google Sheets where, wherever it is. You copy it. I just hit Control C, but you can right click and hit and uh, hit right click and hit copy. Uh, and then I'm going to paste it. Now, when I paste it, 
it's going to say, hey, do you want to link it to the spreadsheet? And that's what you want. Because if you just paste on link, that's just a snapshot. So if I change it in the spreadsheet, it doesn't change anywhere else. So I want to keep it linked. And here's the, 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 the one painful thing that happens. You have to change the table. And you just do it, you just do it the one time. Just change the width of the the um columns there. So I know that this column's way out here. So I'm gonna bring that in. And I know it's invisible, you can't see it. That's just because I don't have any um any lines on my document. Uh and then I'm going to bring this down and I'm going to left align it. And now I have set it and I can forget it. So this is organized the way I want it to. When I come in next semester to change this document, all I have to do is make sure that this is updated and I'll change this to be 12 p.m. Just so we have a change. All I have to do is when I'm updating this thing to say spring 2023, I'll just update this as well. So I have a few different objects that are linked in here, which is pretty nice. And by the way, I use the same exact trick for my letter grades. This is a table that's in a Google Sheet. And my due dates. This is a table that's in my Google Sheet. So if there were any changes, I'd have to update it. And if you don't know where, the, if, if you're like me and you're like, oh, I created this like two years ago. I forgot where this document is in my Google Drive. That's okay because you can always just say open source and we'll open up the source to that. So I did the same thing. I just copied the table from my Google. Actually, I, I will open this source. Um, I just copied that table from my Google sheet, literally copied control C, option C, right click C, and then I pasted it into my Google doc. So this document can be updated. You know, every semester you just go through, make sure that your wording is good and and your content is good and just update the things that need to be updated your student time your your office hours i have an extra space in there let me get rid of that uh things like that and one of the really neat things is these links work so um this is this is a link to uh my office hours and you can see this hyperlink which actually lives in google sheets still works so if, if your links change for your office hours, you you can change it in your single source of truth, and that gets pushed out, which is pretty slick. Two questions. Yeah. Um, so I can change the format in this instance without changing the original Google Sheet format. So, for instance, I just made that bold, and I'll come back over here. And is there a way of automating that? update feature do i have to click something you have to click something but you don't have to click the thing i showed you to click because they have something i think it's called under tools uh linked objects there is a button and i the cat's out of the bag but i can update all of them at once okay because that would be a pain like especially if i forget to do one yeah <laughs> yes and, so and everybody knows except that class <laughs> oh that, that is a good point um the, so I would recommend underneath tools going to uh, under tools. If you open up the linked objects, you can hit this button and it will up link. It will actually does it. I think it does. Um, but at the very least, you can click on it. Um, like you can see that you have four four different linked objects. Uh, now, to answer your question, the from a more technical standpoint. The, Google has done an awesome job with extensions. So if, you, if you're like, Dave, I would really like you to write an extension that would update that, I can do that for you. Um, that would actually be kind of fun for me, I think. Um, but the last, the last thing that I want to show you that is updatable, uh, because I showed you, like from a productivity standpoint, having my student time updating is great. My, my, uh, this grading scale, that hardly ever changes. Uh, but I, I just like to have it in my Google sheet anyhow, since I'm going to have this stuff. But I also update my image and I don't copy and paste images into my Google Docs either. I make them Google drawings because if I want my headshot to be updated, well, it, across all my 
across all my documents. And in my, that headshot might appear somewhere else as well. Um, all I have to do is create, this is a Google drawing. And remember, a Google drawing is kind of like a Google Slides with only one slide. Uh, it, but it's, it's got like the ordering and the layering. So let, let's say that I wanted to put like a little mustache on me. This is me changing my headshot. Now I just come back over here and I update that too. I never insert a Google drawing in a Google doc. I always create the drawing externally as a file on its own for a few different reasons. One of them is because you can change the canvas size here. One of them is because if I create it in my Google Drive as a drawing, and again, like I have all these drawings here, I can embed it in multiple documents. But if you're in Google Docs and you want to insert a drawing, always insert it as a standalone file from Google Drive, never create a new one in Google Docs because your tool set's a little bit reduced. It's just not, it's, it's a little wonky and you can't recycle them. There's no single source of truth there. So I always insert my drawings from Google Drive. A question in the chat. Yeah. Um, can you do the same thing with Google Forms? And James, maybe you can um, tell us the context of that because I am a few minutes late on bringing that up. So you're on mute. I'm unmuted, I'm sorry. No, I was just curious because there's a lot of flexibility in forms and I was wondering if you could do, I know forms will update uh, spreadsheets, but I'm wondering if you can, you know, create them in the form and then embed the form like you did here and be able to do that. You use it for quizzes. We use it for quizzes and other Oh, things. yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm sorry, what's your name? Jim. 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 Um, as a matter of fact, We'll just skip ahead to to one of the things I did. So are you talking about embedding things into the Google Forms or embedding Google Forms into Brightspace? Yeah, Google Forms into Brightspace. Like yeah, right now, now I do, like right now I'm using Office. So what I do is I go into Forms there, create quizzes, then generate the QR codes and sometimes put those inside the presentation. So at the end of class, if there's a quiz, they just use their phones and they take a picture of the QR code and take the quiz and off they go. So that's a slick idea. If we can do that there. I'm going to steal that idea if you don't mind. You can have it. I didn't, I stole it from somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> not that good. Um, you, not only can you embed Google Forms. So I, I have, I happen to have a form uh, called Instructor Feedback, but you can embed it with uh, drop downs, actually, just pre filled with anything. So you can see I've embedded this with 2023 Spring Technology and Education, even though I have all these different courses and I have all these different semesters. So you can embed the Google form right in uh, Brightspace. And it, it's it's roughly the same thing. Uh, let's see where I think, <laughs> look, I believe that I have the Google form and did I not put it in? Oh, no. Is it? That. Is it linked to, or is it just pasted in? So, uh, so, so can you make changes to the form and they get reflected? Oh, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, yep. So let's see, here it is right here. So this form, if I were to change it, so I'm just gonna change it just so we can see the difference. I'm gonna say, help me do better with lots of exclamation points. Now, if I come back over here and hit refresh, then it's going to have all those exclamation points. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yep. You're still you're still in one. You got one form that you're editing, but it's being displayed by linking to multiple. No, Correct. In two separate courses. That's what I mean. Correct. So uh, to embed this, I, I haven't created. So I haven't built this out yet but I intend on this tool having one for Google Sheets, Google Slides, and Google Forms down the road. And a lot of those are probably YouTube videos because you can't you can't really like bend the URLs for those other tools as much as you can here. Um, but at any rate, if you go to send, you're gonna get this embed tool and this is what you copy and paste into Brightspace. Oh, okay. Does that make sense for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And then if you did wanna pre-fill it, 
you have to get the pre-filled link. So maybe I want to have it be computing sciences portal. And I get that link. And so now that's in my, uh, my clipboard, I would just have to replace, I'd have to like look at this link a little bit. And there'll, there'll be a YouTube video about this later in the semester yeah. where instead of view form, I'd have to paste in that, like it has like the appendages for the different fields. Okay. But yeah, you, you can do that. So, so I'm guessing you don't really want the student in this course to change that. To change. Yeah, and I could, if I really want them to give you feedback for 2017 of some other course. No, that's a good point. And as it's funny you should mention that because I've been living with this since 2017. And as I was looking at it about 45 seconds ago, this is like a great example of reflection in practice. I was like, this is such a terrible idea. Although, um, because like, when no, no one's going to do it. Make it static. I could make it static or I could just um, delete all the options except that one. Um, yeah. In fact, I probably don't even need to have this field now that I think about it. Um, although I would know from the timestamp anyhow, because any form drops in a timestamp. So, uh, so I would know. I think it being a field is good because then you potentially could return on all the courses and do some statistics around a single document. Your, as your I feedback know. for all of your classes if you wanted to, but you don't want them to be able to control what the course is yeah. in your particular course. And now I'm thinking about it, one other way that I could do it. So right now I have this one form for all my courses. So there still is a little bit of wiggle room. So you can be like, uh -huh, I'm going to give bad feedback for a class I'm not in. You can have multiple forms all funnel into one spreadsheet. So maybe that's a safer way to do it too. Um, Because then then they wouldn't have. What you want to yeah. Do with it. Yeah. Uh, that's good advice. I, I think I'm going to rethink this. Um, but in all honesty, I usually only get two or three hits a semester from this because this is like help me do better. Like, is there something that's not going on in course? Well, uh, yeah, it is. It is anonymous unless they they insert their email and I tell them that. Um, and, and a lot of times students will give me their email. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so you can do that with the forms and it works uh, pretty much the same exact way. This is the oversharing uh, population. Here. Oh, it, sh it sure is. Oh, thank you. I'm going to, well, and it gets better or it stays the same, but it doesn't get, it might get worse. <laughs> well, we'll see. It's good to know what the choice is. <laughs> One of those three things is, is the case. This is uh, a Google slide I made. And most Google slides are like 10 by eight. And if you change the canvas on Google slides, which you can do, you can make it into an infographic, which I did. And this infographic has links in it. So I put this in all my courses. In fact, everyone in the department does. And so, for instance, if you have a robust FYE program and you have FYE stuff, make it into a Google Slides, embed it. So now if students need help getting to the right place, they click on this and it brings them to the writing center. And if the hours change from semester to semester, I go here and I just change it in the one single source of truth. So again, I did put that in here. Uh, this academic support. So so you can see kind of, again, this is, you know, like how the sausage gets made. It's pretty ugly here, but it works well um, when you embed it. The, the one caution I have about this is on mobile, when you have really long presentations like this, it doesn't look all that great. It's, it's manageable, but it's not all that great. So I try and make, have a responsive first design when I make all these like different tools. Uh, and so if I, in fact, if I showed you what this looks like on mobile right now, you'd see like th there's the contents there and the links are there, but you're going to have to like scroll to the left and to the right. Um, so th this is the one failure of this particular thing, but, but it works pretty good in general. And I think there was one other thing I wanted to show you. Oh yeah. Uh, one of the other things, and I showed this at CIT in the spring and th there was a collective gasp from the six people in the audience. But if you have a Google Drive folder, you can embed that as well. And uh, here it is right here. So in Brightspace, if you have files, maybe you have an OER textbook and you want to give the files out. Maybe you have labs and you have like different PDFs, you can give it out. And again, this is a single source of truth. This is nothing more than embedding this file 
in Brightspace. And by the way, one thing that you can do, uh, and I'm just showing off here, but I have uh, tabs here. You can also have it as icons. So, oh, look at that. Oh, we just did that. Um, so you can have icons as well uh, as a file list. You, you probably only need one, but I like to have both of them. Um, so again, I don't have the, it learns brightspace.com under the tools. I don't have one for Google Drive yet, but I will have one. Every piece of code, every piece of code that we're going over today, if you're brave and remember, press buttons, but every piece of code, if you go to the planning folder in the agenda, I actually have like the code that I used and I put it, I think, let's see, did I do it right? Fingers crossed, yeah. So like to embed the PDF that I haven't shown you yet, this is how to do it, to embed the, um, the Google Drive audio, which I haven't done yet, you can do it. So I have code for all the different things that I'll be showing you. In fact, I have one for um, the Google Drive folders too. Oh yeah, it's right here. So, so you can just copy this code and this code will never change with the exception of what's known as your ID. So this ID, if you just replace it with whatever the URL is up here, this is the same, this is the same exact thing. Oh, um, I lied. This is the same exact thing. Um, so you, so you can, you can do it that way. Uh, but, or you can just wait until I flesh out these tools, which I'll be doing throughout the course of the semester. And this is, I, so I showed you how to embed a Google Doc and how to embed things in the Google Doc. So still maintaining that single source of truth mentality. Uh, I, I don't think there's anything else that I need to show you here. So let's go now and show you a little bit more about things that I've been embedding. This right here, you might recognize, you're like, oh, this definitely looks like a Google Sheet. And it is. You can embed... Um, select cells from a Google spreadsheet. So I use this sheet as my planning for everything I do throughout the semester. And I've created it such that you can add rows and delete rows. Um, and it generates the code for you right here. So again, this is the one thing that you're copying and pasting. And it will result in this. So if, if there's a snow day, or if I need to push my work back one day, I can change it here. Or maybe I want to, maybe maybe this semester we're not doing um, this assignment schedule in, an appointment with me. Um, so then I can just go to strike through and strike that out. And if I refresh, then you can expect that it will be struck out here as well. So I like to have at the beginning of every module, um, just this. Now that if you are changing the due dates, of course, you still have to change them in Brightspace, but this is a single place to look at it. And I'm going to show you two other things right now, uh, um, how to embed a PDF. So in one of my cybersecurity courses, I have all the students kind of as a culminating pro project, find us a breach, explain what happened, debrief on, on the fallout and then say, but it could have been prevented this way. And that's where they kind of show hopefully what they've learned all semester long. And I compile it into a PDF. So I have past ones from the students or past, I have them from past semesters. So the students can kind of see it and kind of get a feel for it. So this is a PDF that surprise, surprise lives in my Google drive and is just a good way is, is this document right here. Um, this is just a good way to share it with students is to uh, embed it right in Brightspace. And, and again, the code for that, you can expect to see that at learnbrightspace.com in a little bit, but if you can't wait for it and you really want to make the magic happen, it's this code right here. Just make sure you change the file ID. Otherwise, you'll be embedding my really nerdy cybersecurity paper. You can also embed audio files that live in your Google Drive. So I have a WAV file and 
the wave file right now is just some music and you can't hear it because I'm on mute. Um, but this could be, this is an OER textbook that uh, has been worked on over the past few years with my students and other faculty and I. I could record myself reading it and have an audio version that students can download just by hitting that button or they can play it and, and listen to it. And again, all that is, is in my single source of truth, I happen to have an MP3 file, this music file right here, and I just use the code in here to, um, to embed it. So you just literally copy this code, change the file ID, and paste that code into Brightspace, and you get a nice kind of clean look. Uh, actually, Brightspace decorates it like this, or else um, Google Chrome does. But it looks really, really slick. I didn't do anything. All I did is say, hey, here's the file. So you, you can have these audio files that are both embedded, playable, and also downloadable just by hosting it in Google Drive. And I guess we'll do this. Ooh, this one is, oh, that, that one was really nice. And I'll show you this document. So three more documents. Are, are there any questions right now? Uh, no, okay. not at the moment. But feel free to keep dropping them in the chat. Yeah, feel free to keep dropping them in the chat. I should probably close some of this stuff. This is uh, an, an, an example of an infographic assignment that we have. We, technical writing is one of our um, outcomes in the department, in the program. So we just have like the whole assignment and the discussion. This is, we done at 1220 today? Yeah. 1220. Okay. Yep. The one upstairs just finished. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and so one of the best practices that I like doing is having previous submissions so that students get an example of what it looks like. And in the infographic, what I've done is I've taken three of them and I saved them as PDFs in Google Docs, or in, I'm sorry, my Google Drive. And I created a Google drawing, believe it or not. So this is a Google drawing that has hot links in it. So if a student wants to see the infographic on Raspberry Pi, they click on it and it will pop up the PDF version so that they can see the, the, the entire graphic. And that, that's kind of cool just in general that they have different examples, but the really neat thing is like, well, what if someone does a really, 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 really good job of infographics and I want to update that? All I do is I go to this Google Drive, the, I'm sorry, this Google Drawing that I keep in my Google Drive. And let me zoom out because I have one, I have one queued up. I can just replace this image with whichever one I want it to go over. Let's say it's right there. And then I just have to give it a link to the PDF. And I don't have this right now, but I would just uh, create a link to that. And I just have it go to the literal URL of the PDF in Google Drive. So you can update this very, very simply. So now when you come back over here, if I refresh the page, then we should see that IBM one is gone and it has the new infographic there. So I can, that's a great way to update uh, examples of student work very, very simply um, without having to adjust your content in Brightspace. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, one of the things that we are kicking the tires on in the department at FLCC is we've observed that there's a really, really, really wonky issue with Brightspace. And this drives me batty. And as graphic designers and web designers, like this might, you probably observe this as well. Um, let's see, let me go back to my pinned courses. But when Brightspace doesn't render all content the same, so for instance, uh, if you create a file, 
in your stream in Brightspace, all you get in that file is a link to it. But if you create an, an assignment, the whole assignment instructions are rendered there. So if you have kind of like a lot of back and forth of some links, some assignments, it's easy for things to kind of get lost in the shuffle if students are looking at the list here. So for instance, uh, let's say that I'm in this module right here. You can see, oh, there's some activities, but then when you have an assignment, it kind of commandeers everything. And if it's a lengthy assignment, then it, it takes up a lot of screen re uh, real estate. And then if you have, imagine if there was like one little link in between these two different assignments, it might be really easy to skip things. So what we're doing instead is we have created this because Brightspace allows us to use internal links. We now just link to the assignment. We don't build the assignment in the module. We just keep the assignment in assignments. So right here. So you can see in this course, there's like three assignments and I've said submissions after each one of them. So for the infographic assignment, when all I do is link to it. So I, I can have as, as much instruction as I want. This is a really long assignment. And when the students are ready, they click here. And all I did in Brightspace was make this a link to this. Oops. Well, because I'm in teacher view, you're going to see the teacher, um, which is problematic. Although I do, this is, this is one of the things that drives me bonkers about Brightspace is you can't have a student, a separate student view like you could in Blackboard. And if you, if I were to click right here on view as student, then it would bring me back to the top of the course, which is really, really annoying. However, so that's what I'm going to do here. If you are in Brightspace in any of your courses, and in one tab, you've gone into the student view, you can see I'm in the student view. If you go back to your other tab, and I'm like two, two folders down right now, if I refresh this, it stays where I am, except as a student view, which is pretty nice. Yeah. So, so now I'm viewing this as a student, and I can click here. And the actual assignment that I edited as an instructor just says, if you have any question on the assignment, oops. If you have any assignments on any question on the assignment, read the description. Guess what? This links back to where we just came from. And then I just have them paste their link in the Google Doc. So I call this one tab my sacrificial tab. This is what I toggle between my faculty view and my student view. So I just always kind of keep that tab open change it as needed and then come back and just refresh. So I'm I'm in my uh oh I closed the tab where I was in my student view. So now I'm back in my faculty view. Um so that that's one of the things we've been doing. So now when you see the actual stream in Brightspace, it's going to only be links. That's all you'll ever see. So there's a lot less chance of students scrolling over things. Um, and you can still advance from content to content with the navigation arrows in the upper right and the lower right. Uh, this is just a simple example of if you have a presentation like a Google Slides, I like to embed my Google Slides, but I also like to have the video narration. Uh, and this could be like either recording me doing it in class or doing it from home. And so th this is the same exact assignment. So somewhere in here, you'll see the Somewhere in here, you'll see the Nick Cage slide, but uh, it just happens to be that when I uploaded that video to YouTube, it just the title card it took was this Nicolas Cage one. So I always embed all my presentations, but with this option for students, I give them the, the YouTube video as well. And then when the presentation, same thing, all these are links. They're not real buttons. It's just a hyperlink. This is the slash copy. This is the slash format PowerPoint. And this is the slash format PDF. So I didn't do anything special. You can expect that this will make its way to learnbrightspace.com in that tool set in the next few wee months. And let, uh, there, there's 
uh, two types of assignments that I want to show you that we use well, because we use Google Docs quite a bit. Um, this is an example of one. So this, the instructions say, click this link to make a copy. So again, this is just the link to this Google Doc, except instead of edit, I use copy. So it's going to force a copy. And so when students get this document, there's no question about where they put their work because I found in when I had skeleton documents before students might not know exactly where to put their work so all I all we did here was we made tables this is a one by one table and so the student just has to um delete this and put in their own work there and that if they type in three or four sentences then the document gets bigger and bigger and bigger and so then when they're done doing their work they take this link or share it with me and that's what they paste in for their submission so I really, really love students doing all their works in Google Docs for a few reasons. One, at the end of the semester, if they do it in Word and submit it to me and I leave comments on it, well, those comments are like embedded in that PDF file or their Word file that lives in Brightspace. So like, good luck getting that out. But if they own the document and just give me access to it or a link that anyone can edit, then they keep that forever. And all the comments that I leave on it, because I'll leave comments on documents quite a bit. So let's just imagine that they wrote something there. I might leave a comment that says like, oh, I, I love this idea. This is the, the name of this game that you created is very, very intriguing. And if they comment on it, that goes to my Gmail. So I'll get an alert when they comment on it. So we can have dialogue, which is kind of cool. But the other thing, and this is relatively new in Google Docs, they allow you to comment with emoji. You can actually vote. So if, if three or four people were in this document, um, that's what that, that one is. That means one person loved that particular comment so i use emojis all the time when i'm grading because if i like something i like leaving a breadcrumb trail and like a proof of purchase that yes i've read everything that you've submitted and this emoji is way quicker than writing a sentence or two sentences about what they're doing um and in fact the wall street journal and new york times just wrote they just published something last week about how the generation z loves emojis and like it was basically a guide of how to like interact with gen zers through emojis which was kind of cool um, so, and again, to do that, all you have to do is click anywhere on a document, highlight a word, and hit the add emoji reaction. And then you can also leave comments if you want. So now the student owns this document. It has, um, the student owns this document. It has the comments. I can comment either through Gmail for my phone if when I get an alert, and this happens frequently, or I can come into the document and leave more comments for them. So. Uh, I'm a big fan of doing it that way. And again, like they will click here and all this does is bring them to the actual assignment where they have to submit the, the link to their URL. And one of the questions I get all the time is, Dave, have you ever gotten a link from students in the beginning of the semester where like it's not shared so that you can comment on it? I'm like, yeah, that happens all the time. So the very first assignment we have students do is called the first assignment. And it's a Google Doc. And because, I guess I'll just make a copy of it. And by the way, if you hit that link to make a copy, if I own this document, which I do, all I have to do if I want to get to the document instead of making another copy is delete the copy in the URL and it brings me to the, the original document. So I don't even have to know where it lives in my Google Drive. So I, the very first assignment, and again, this is in the Google Drive, so you can bastardize this, use it however you want in your course. Um, it talks about how to share so that anyone can comment. We, we walk through, we walk through, um, students through how to take screenshots on their computer so that, because a lot of our labs require screenshots. So this talks about screenshots and how to resubmit files. And you can see this animated GIF is moving real slow, but I show them how to change the, the file name and then. I show them what, what a bad screenshot looks like in a good screenshot after telling them, you know, hey, here's videos on how you can actually take screenshots. And I show them what a really, really bad screenshot looks like. And then their job is to take a screenshot of something, delete my screenshot and paste in theirs. So I call that evidence one. So if this was a lab, this would be the very first evidence. And then evidence two is checkboxes and Google Docs has introduced interactive checkboxes. So the students can do each one of these to a test that they've 
learn the skill of how to change a link, how to, um, I have to undo all that because this is actually the, the one that my students will be using. Um, and then when, when I, when it's my turn to grade these assignments, and there's only two pieces of evidence here. So obviously I could scroll down, but in some of the labs I do, there's three, four, five, six, seven different steps. Because I use, and you should use this for accessibility reasons anyhow, but if you use like heading one, heading two, heading three, all I have to do is click on evidence one, see something, give it an emoji reaction, click on evidence two, brings me down, see that they've done that. So that's how I grade the labs very rapidly is by using the document structure. Ooh, okay. So, and again, this document, if you want to use this document, this document lives in the Google Drive that you all have access to. And again, just to get access to it, go to learnbrightspace.com and go to presentations, Oswego winter breakout. You'll get, and maybe I'll put a link to the Google Drive so you, you can actually, and I should probably do that. I'll do that before I leave today, but after this presentation. And if you want to download the zip file, just to see kind of like what happens under the hoods of what this course looks like, you can do that. This course, I believe, uses all the documents are used right from this Google Drive. So these are all the documents that, um, and just looking at these thumbnails, you're like, oh yeah, that looks very, very similar. And we've seen all this stuff today. All right. Are there any questions? Nothing in the chat yet. Okay. I do just want to remind you that it's not important you remember how to do any of this. It's just important to remember that it can be done because you can always figure out how to do it some other time. Under what? Oh, Jim, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. There's a plate. We were just trying to figure this out, but I, I'm I sure John will know. Where Where is it? So if you go to add like file, Google, and then remember, you know where it says my computer and it's under that. So. Yeah, there's in this, in Brightspace, there's the thing that says Google Drive. What What is the function of that particular thing? I think it's under course admin or course no. tools. Or what's it yeah. under? Add a file. Oh, add a file. Yeah, when you, you well, there's there's actually two places where, and, and this is relatively new, there's two places where that is. When you add a file, you can add it from your Google Drive. I don't particularly like linking my Google Drive to anything. Um, and even when you do, I don't think you get it necessarily embedded the way I want it with the buttons to download as PDF, Word, stuff like that. So I never use that button. But the other thing that's really wonky, and I'm hoping that I want answers today, is... From these like modules, I was kind of kicking the tires on the modules on these widgets. There's a new widget in here, uh, at least one that I haven't seen before. Um, called Access Google Workspace and also Google Workspace. My college actually, we're a Microsoft Word campus, even though I haven't touched Microsoft Office in 15 years. Um, so because I still do all this Google stuff anyhow. But I imagine like a Swigo might use this. I don't know what that is. It was something that was not working until very recently. So okay. I haven't had a chance to even answer okay. it yet. It was an integration that wasn't complete as far as I recall. Yeah, I did notice it the other day and was like, what is this? Yeah, it's new, but, right? Yeah, it was one of the FCI integrations that yeah. were not active last fall. Okay. So, yeah, I noticed that there was a number of those LTI yeah. integrations that weren't active last fall. There's are, are they active now, John? Yes. Okay. Whether they work or not, it is up to you. It's some trial. So try it and see. Okay, great. Thanks. But embedding materials is probably more effective for the reasons Dave mentioned. There's another question here. Um, Kristen Haynes asked, uh, can you use the embed code in other scenarios such as into Drupal websites? Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's pure HTML. So it'll work in Drupal, it'll work in WordPress, it'll work anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and... and to be clear, anything that I showed in this probably doesn't affect most of the people here, but anything I showed you with Google Docs, for the most part, I'd say like 85%, you can do that with, if you happen to live like in a Microsoft Office world, like you can still embed stuff, but it's not as clean and mm -hmm. it's just not as refined, uh, but you can embed anything. Uh, so for instance, if you go to soundcloud.com, for instance, where people can host music, almost anywhere you go, or if you go to Quizlet, I'll go to both these. Almost anything has an embed. So I, I don't I don't know what this music is. Um, but when you go to it, it always lives somewhere. 
when you go to like share, usually you can see there's like an embed, there's the embed tab right there. So this is the HTML that I just copy and paste. If you're in Quizlet and you want to embed, uh, for instance, uh, flashcards, which I've been doing more and more after reading Make It Stick, um, talking about uh, just like interleaving and space practicing. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, oh my goodness, almost every third party software out there allows you to embed. So let's see, this is, I, I think I can share. And usually it's underneath the share button. Um, and that mixes it up. So I don't, I actually don't know where it is here, but I know that there is an embed somewhere. Sometimes you have to like poke around and YouTube has it too. YouTube has like the embed feature. There it is, share. Um, and then uh, there's a way to embed it. Sometimes you have to do it a little bit differently, but anyhow, you can embed all this stuff. Um, almost anything that you're using, chances are you can embed it in your course. And another question, um, um, also from uh, Kristen. Uh, I've struggled at times with formatting in Google Docs. Just curious, do you use Slide Carnival to generate any of your Google Docs, not slides? Um, um, I'm not sure if they have doc templates as well as slides. I don't know if they do or not. Um, I do know if you're at Google Docs and you create a new one, they have templates right here. If you just click on that icon, um, there are a number of different templates right here for Google Docs. Hmm. Uh, and I do feel your pain. Google is really, really good at putting out a, a minimally viable product and rolling out incremental changes and not telling people about those changes. So there's a lot of things that you can do now in Google Docs, like uh, watermarks that you couldn't do for years and years and years. There's a lot of things um, like sections where you can have different sections with different like formatting that you couldn't do before. So I always build things from scratch. It takes me about 10 times longer. And this is true in Brightspace too. But I, as a, the collateral learning and building things from scratch in Brightspace or in Google Docs is you get a better appreciation of what's changed, what the features are. Um, I'm not so sure that I would have figured out uh, about those uh, interactive checkboxes if I hadn't known about it. So, and that, that's a really easy thing to do now. So if you have like three things that you have on a to-do list, instead of doing a bulleted list or a numbered list, they just have this checkbox thing and it automatically formats them as checkboxes. So my, if you're struggling with formatting, uh, I guess I have three responses. One, you might want to check those templates. And again, the, the templates I got to just by going to uh, this document, Google Docs home, which you can access just by going to any Google Doc and doing this. Um, so you can look at these templates. You can also just kind of like kick the tires and, and just poke around and press buttons. Or the third thing is like, maybe formatting isn't even that important for your first go around. I like to, I have very iterative approaches on my course design and my document design where I get Seth Godin, who's a self-proclaimed marketer that I follow. He's, he always just says, ship it. It does not need to be perfect. It will never be perfect. Ship it, make it better the next time around. And that's kind of the mentality I've adopted. So, you know, and I kind of feel guilty for my students the first semester because the course is not up to my standards, but it's, it's on the way. And, uh, you know, I tell the students, I'm like, Hey, tell me the pain points. Tell me, tell me what, what hurts and what's not working for you. Cause I want to change it in the future. Um, so, you know, take the students along for the ride with you. Uh, the, I would say if you are creating any document from scratch, the, the single best thing you can do for your turn on investment is use headings and styles, heading one, heading two, heading three, because that gives you the structure for organization. And it also makes it way more accessible. And it's, it's super easy. Good question. So I, I'm, I'm still processing something, so I'll ask you. Okay, please. So is what you do with use of Google Docs as extensively as you do, is it your thing or FLCC's thing? Uh, I think it's my thing. So I guess the question that I have is that at some point you decided that I don't want to keep my content in the course management system, whether it's Blackboard. And I'm glad I didn't last year. <laughs> <laughs> But yes. I mean, it was Nick and Forsyth. 
if that's what you've been doing, but I guess what was the, there's something in you that says this is a better idea. And I guess I haven't quite processed that. It's John and I were talking before about Angel. Angel had a wonderful lore, the Learning Object Repository. Blackboard had a fake lore that didn't work well. And I got really sick of triplicating my work from section to section to section. And I was like, well, this Google Docs is in the text editor in Blackboard up until the last six months of when we were using it was awful. It was unreliable. Like the headings, like when you programmed it and then when you viewed it, it was completely different. I was like, but Google Docs is this WYSIWYG editor. It's perfect. I can change it. And then, so this evolved over the years. I, I've gotten to a point now where like almost everything's embedded, but, um, but it took a while and I'm not convinced on the right answer or not, but you are kind of tiptoeing to a question of like, is there, there's, it's really melded together now. So a lot of my content, if you were looking at, so for instance, the instructions for the infographic, that wasn't a Google doc. That was, that all that content still lived in Brightspace. Mm -hmm. um, and so let me just pull it up right here. So a lot of my content and thoughts are still in Brightspace. It's just the mechanism of delivery for PDFs, for assignments. I want students to do the assignments. And that was one of the other things I had is the walled garden of, Bright, of Blackboard and Brightspace. Students couldn't access their work anymore after the semester ended. I was like, well, that, that's not great for them. So, um, or at least my comments on their work, hopefully they, all, they always had their work. So by sh shifting to Google Docs, and I found, by the way, and you're a Google campus, so that's not an issue for you. We're not at Finger Lakes. Um, and a lot of times when I present and talk to faculty, like, oh, we're a Microsoft house. But most students come <laughs> from K-12 institutions now. And so they're, they're used to it. So uh, it's kind of like meeting them where they're at. It was, there's, I never have had an intentional decision to sequester my work from Finger Lakes or from MCC when I was there. Uh, it's more of like, it works in tandem. And especially if you're teaching multiple sections of a course or multiple courses with the same content or some of the yeah. same or, content, it's much easier to create at once. And late start courses. There. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, one, so I know there's like two minutes left. Are there any questions in there? Oh, um, no, just a comment that um, Jennifer said that the biggest uh, tip she's taking away um, is for assignment real estate. And... Oh, good. Well, uh, let me know how that works because we didn't do that last semester. That's just something we're doing this semester. So, but I tested it as best I could with a student account and it seems to work okay. Uh, so uh, don't yell at me at the end of the semester or in the first week of the semester if it doesn't work well. I believe it does as, as best as I can test it does. But it is a nice way to like kind of keep everything all together. Um, and we'll probably do that because I think discussions work that way too and maybe quizzes as well. Uh, the last thing I want to show you, and this is just um, this is just a teaser for something we're working on in the department, um, is having, again, ground truth, but making a very graphical element to Brightspace. So Brightspace, if you're a web nerd, lives on Bootstrap, which is a phenomenal HTML tool for formatting your text, but they don't unleash all the power. They kind of keep it hidden. But because it's there, we, we've created this like really, really nifty way where you can say like, oh, uh, let's say we want chapter two to be, I don't know, cybersecurity. And we want to have a description so we'll use heading one. And Markdown is a very, very simple way to write text where you just use the pound sign for heading one. If you have two heading two, you use two pound signs. Uh, so we'll, we're, we're, we actually have this tool out in the wild for, um, for you to try, but we'll be releasing videos on this as well. And hopefully I just put a proposal in the CIT to have a pre-workshop for using this tool. Because once you... And this, by the way, has all the things Brightspace does. One of the things we didn't like about Brightspace was when you're doing accordions or tabs, you could do one or the other, but it's hard to do both. But we we can do all of that in, all in one thing. And then, so let, let me show you, for instance, like here we have, uh, this is what the accordion will look like. And we have different tabs here, so you can see all three of them. But when you copy this code, this again, it's just HTML and paste it into Brightspace, then it renders really, really nice. Uh, so I'll, I'm going to close on that because I know my time is up, but I'm just going to create a file and I'll just give it 
um, a name of MD for Markdown. And again, you don't need to understand how this tool works or what it does, but you do need to be blown away by how beautiful it can make your uh, Brightspace document. And this is all responsive. So if we were on a mobile device, it just makes it just so nice. So we've leveraged the framework that um, Brightspace is built on and made it a lot easier to, to, ma to manage. And with that, I'm done. But I do want to thank you uh, for coming in um, and tuning in and checking this out. If you have any questions, uh, you can certainly email me. I, I guess I'll put my name up on the screen right, or my email address on the screen right now. I know that's really small. So let me... That's my email address. Um, obviously, you'll be able to get it from through the CELT. -E Is it, do you say CELT -E or do you say CELT? Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, so you can get that through the CELT. Uh, you can certainly talk to me. I'm super happy to answer your questions. And probably in the, the best thing you can also do is go to learnbrightspace.com and uh, go to the Google Doc linker if you want to kick the tires on the Google Doc thing, and then go to presentations if you want a list of all these files. And with that, thank you very much for sticking two minutes over. Thank you. Are we gonna, yeah. Uh, is there going to be like an email or something, John, with the links and where the video and everything was it recorded, wasn't it? Uh, the videos are all posted by this evening. In fact, our first oh, okay. already oh, okay. up today. We have a, okay. I sent an email this morning with a link to the, um, the YouTube playlist, and it will also be on the schedule with a link to the recording. Oh, great. Great, thanks, John. Yeah, I have to go back to some house. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure meeting you. Thanks for coming in.